kuyemora dumela saubona ita. Thank you, church. My name is Lesejo, and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ through Fellowship City. As one of the elders and pastors here, this morning I have the privilege of sharing the word of God with you. Today is the finale of our series on Proverbs titled, God's World, God's Way. We say to live in God's world, God's way is wisdom. Wisdom is not only knowing, but it is doing. Wisdom is not only hearing, but it is also applying. We know that everything we see or everything we have is God's. God has a will for it and we need to know His will. We need to know His wisdom so that we know how to live in His will, in His world. Wisdom is the ability to apply insight, to apply learned knowledge. Knowledge comes from looking around, wisdom comes from looking up. Looking to God who gives that wisdom. Knowledge comes from study and wisdom comes from meditation. God gives us wisdom in order for us to glorify him and use the knowledge we have of him. This is why we study Proverbs, to learn God's word, to know how to live in his world and to bring him glory. These are a couple of quotes that are popular. Follow your heart is a popular phrase or quote that many individuals give us advice. Here are some of those kinds of phrases and quotes. A poet by the name of Rumi from the 13th century says, follow your heart, it knows the way. A quote that is similar but not attributed to someone is believe in yourself and follow your heart. People who live by these quotes often do so with rose-tinted glasses but soon wonder how they got to where they got to. Another quote is from Ray Bennett, who is an author, who says, don't be pushed around by the fears in your mind. Be led by the dreams in your heart. A similar quote, follow your heart because if you always trust your mind, you'll act on logic, and logic doesn't always lead to happiness. Also used by many motivational speakers, both of these quotes have a tension between the logic and the emotion, driving more emphasis on emotions, taking charge and emotions bringing happiness. Another quote is from Jack Canfield. If it excites you and scares you at the same time, it probably means you should do it, which is a scary thought if you think about it. It alludes to emotions being signs that something is right. Another quote from Steve Jobs, there is no reason not to follow your heart. Last quote from an unknown author, it's impossible, said pride. It's risky, said experience. It's pointless, said reason. Give it a try, whispered the heart. Sure. Follow your heart is a quote or phrase that belongs behind um, what is called expressive individualism movement. Other quotes or phrases that belong to this movement are be true to yourself and find yourself. So expressive individualism is the idea that meaning and identity are given to us, are not given to us by outside influences, whether parents, whether church, whether God, but rather meaning and identity are found within ourselves. Said another way, life isn't about bringing others into the light and in line with the truth, but life is rather looking in yourself to find your own version of truth and meaning. Most of these quotes say we should follow our hearts, that following our hearts brings fulfillment of dreams, brings happiness. They say our minds bring fear or at times fight against the heart. Same as the expressive individualism movement, which says, in us we find truth and life. What we will see and learn this morning is actually our hearts can't be trusted. Our hearts can be manipulated. We don't have any expression of truth without God. We will learn that the expressive individualism movement, in its essence, is a distraction from truth. Truth that life is about bringing ourselves into the light, living in line with the truth of God. We will learn what the heart is, the dangers of following our heart, and how we lead our heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. Four points this morning. Yes, I said four. I know it sounds strange, but stick with me. Four points and we'll be out this morning. What is the heart? Dangers of following the heart. Why we should guard our hearts. And how do we lead our hearts. Let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you that we can gather as your people um, to sing songs of praise and worship, to fellowship with one another, and to sit under the lordship of your word. We thank you that you are here by your spirit, and we pray now that as we come to sit under your word, that we would hear your voice speaking, that your spirit would be at work, that your spirit would be encouraging, would be teaching, would be rebuking, according to wherever everyone is. Would you be at work this morning? Would you remove any distractions? And would you enable us to hear your voice? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What is the heart? That is our first point. We need first to have a handle of what the heart is. In the Hebrew language, the word used to explain heart is lev. Lev in Hebrew, in the translation of the Hebrew language, can either be translated as either mind or heart. In context, ancient authors or the, or the Israelites didn't have the concept of brain. They believe that everything happens in the heart. This is why the Hebrew word lev can either refer to heart or to mind. When emotions or the pumping of blood as a primary function of the heart are translated in the Hebrew, it then refers to the heart, and all other translations would refer to the mind. The Bible does give four ideas of what the heart is, which speak into both the mind and the heart as we understand it from the ancient authors. So the first one is, the first of the four ideas is the heart as an organ that is in the body which pumps blood. It's responsible for keeping us alive. 1 Samuel 25, verse 37, In the morning when the wine had got out of Nabal, his wife told him these things, and his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. In this instance, we see something similar to a heart attack when the heart of Nabal stops. That's the first idea of heart, an organ that pumps blood. The second idea of the heart is the thinking center. Wisdom like we see in Proverbs. Proverbs 14, verse 33 says, Wisdom rests in the heart of a man, of understanding. So the heart also is responsible for keeping wisdom and out of the heart comes wisdom. So the first idea is a organ, second idea is wisdom, the third idea we see the heart is responsible for emotions like pain. So 1 Samuel 1 we see Hannah unable to conceive because she's distressed and is in fear and is depressed. So emotions is also a part of what describes or explains the heart as an idea. The third idea as emotion also equates to joy. We see this in Judges 16 verse 25 and Jeremiah 15 verse 16, which says, and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. From Jeremiah we see that the heart can experience joy. The third idea is the emotions from the heart that we experience. The fourth idea of the heart is where choices are made, which are motivated by desires. So 2 Samuel 7 verse 3, go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. So when we refer to the heart, we refer to the organ, we refer to the thoughts, we refer to the wisdom center, and we refer to the action center, which comes from desires that are in our heart. The Bible also gives us a state of our picture and not only the ideas that make the word heart. The state of our, our heart is seen as in Jeremiah 17 verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? In the New King James Version, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? It says the heart is desperately wicked. It's important to understand how to interpret and consume what we're reading here. It would have been easier to say the heart is sick, but the Hebrew word used here is anas. The word appears nine times in the, in, the, in the Old Testament, five times in Jeremiah. The word in the Hebrew language is mostly used for a wound or a pain that is incurable. So don't miss it, fam. All the different translations contain the same emphasis on the word sick. Not just sick, but terminally sick. The heart is not just wicked, but desperately wicked. If you look up desperate in vocabulary.com, it says having lost all hope. If you are desperate for food, it means you are starving, possibly about to die. 
If you're a football fan and you're desperate for joy, then you are an Arsenal fan. <laughs> you don't know trophies. Things are dire. The situation is really, really bad. If you're a parent, then you might believe that your kids are desperately naughty. They always find ways to plug their fingers in the wall socket, find ways to find and eat a sweet that they don't know where they got from. If you are a vegan, you are desperate. Let's, let's not go to veganism. Let's, <laughs> let's move past it. So the, the word desperate, or if you're in a desperate situation, it means things are really, really bad. So the NIV and CSB translate, it's translated as incurable. So it's so bad that nothing can be done to fix the heart. Vocabulary.com says something inco- in- incurable can't be fixed or healed. Incurable diseases can sometimes be lived with, but they can't be cured. So we are born with a heart that is wicked, that is deceitful, that's desperately wicked and deceitful, that is incurable. In its natural state, the heart is deceitful, dishonest, and disingenuous. The fall, sin entering the world through Adam and Eve has affected our heart, affected our minds, affected our emotions, affected our desires, and affected our actions, as that all encompasses the idea of the heart. We are so affected that we aren't easily able to see the depth of the deception. That is what our hearts are. Our hearts are organs that pump blood, thoughts from the wisdom center, the emotions and desires where action comes from. A heart that is in its nature wicked desperately wicked. So dangers uh, and symptoms. This is why what Steve Jobs said can't be true, or at least in its basic form. He said there is no reason not to follow the heart. Well, there is a reason not to follow the heart if it is desperately wicked. Let's look at some dangers and symptoms of following the heart. Following our hearts can defile us. That's the first one. Following our hearts can defile us. We have a natural inclination towards sin. Out of our hearts come sinful thoughts, actions, and emotions. We spoke about thoughts and actions and emotions being part of the idea of what makes up the heart. So in, its heart, in, in the heart's nature, we find an inclination towards sin. Matthew 15, verse 19 says, For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. Mark 7, verse 21 to 22 says, For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, all these things come from within and they defile a person. So throughout the series, we looked at topics that ultimately speak about the nature of our hearts without God and how with God our hearts are transformed and we are wise. Last week, Reino spoke about words, the power of words, how we should use them and where we should get words. Let's get real, fam. If you meet someone who challenges you for whatever reason, the heart does find things about that person that you can use to slander that person, to make you feel good about yourself. That's how desperately wicked the heart is. She's so smart and has multiple degrees, but have you seen how she speaks to her kids? He's so tall and athletic, but did you see how he treats people he doesn't know? We either know we shouldn't use words to hurt others, but we do, or we don't know that words, words hurt others, which means we don't know the actual state of our hearts. In both situations, we choose to follow our hearts, and we too are deceived in following our own hearts. The continued state of our heart defiles us, defiles the individual. Two weeks before, we looked at the sluggard, a person who is lazy, who is idle, procrastinates, and is self-deceived. Here's what the heart does. The heart gives us an excuse to not start or complete tasks. Reminds you of how tired you have been or how busy your life and schedule is. Reminds you of that Netflix series that you haven't completed yet 
or that TikTok video that made you laugh. The heart seeks to fill itself with comfort from earthly things that bring short moments of fake joy. In both sermon series or both sermon topics, what you would see, what you feed the heart is what it bleeds. If you feed it nothing, you're still feeding it something. You may be feeding it the lies the world believes, then your heart overflows that. John Piper says, if you don't feel strong desires for the manifestation of the glory of God, it is not because you have drunk deeply and are satisfied. It is because you have nibbled so long at the table of the world, your soul is stuffed with small things, and there is no room for the great. There is no room for God. So what are you nibbling on? Is it something that defiles or something that builds, which is God? So the first danger, our hearts, following our hearts can defile us. The second danger is following our hearts can blind us. The heart likes to play the blame game, sometimes even when it's our own fault that bad things happen. Our hearts refuse to take responsibility for actions. And will blame God and others for natural consequences of our choices. If your marriage is hard, it is often because of others and nothing from you. If you're managing your money poorly, it's not the choices you've made. It is the ruling party, which is probably politically correct to say the GNU, or it's probably Lesecha Kanyako. Psalm 51, we see the story of King David. King David on the balcony of his roof sees a woman who is beautiful bathing. King David finds out who she is through his palace servants. She is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, one of the soldiers who is at war. David lies with her. Bathsheba finds out that she's pregnant. David, instead of facing the consequences of his sin, rather manages his sin. Calls for Uriah to come back early from war. Tries to get Uriah to lie with his wife and then find out that they're pregnant. Uriah instead doesn't sleep in the same bed with Bathsheba because he's thinking about his fellow soldiers at war and decides to not sleep in the same bed with her. David levels up his sin, continues to follow the emotions of the heart, the evil thoughts and manages his sin, meaning avoiding to deal with his sin while believing that he is in control of it. Sends Uriah back to the war front line, plans for Uriah to be unprotected and killed in war. After a time of mourning, David marries Bathsheba to continue covering his sin. David follows his heart, lives by his emotions, chooses to covert someone's wife, chooses adultery, and has evil thoughts that lead to murder. King David tries to cover up his sin, which made the circumstances worse. The cover-up was causing him physical problems. Sin can do that to a person. He felt like his bones were crushed. In order for his heart to be cleansed, he had to expose it completely before God. He confessed and repented for what he had done. He didn't try to minimize it or excuse it or defend it. He didn't try to blame anyone else. He acknowledged the evil that led him to do what he did. He confessed that he had followed his heart instead of following God and that it cost him dearly, even the loss of his children. Let's get real. When we follow our hearts, sometimes we are blinded by it and the consequences that come from it. We shout or speak unlovingly to our partners, family, or kids, and we blame them for our outbursts and or passive aggression. When we follow our hearts, we are blinded to the effects of this. Desiring and acting on the desire to be unfaithful to your partner. We say we're not addicted to alcohol. We just enjoy it last every day and need something to take off the edge to start the day. 
I'm not addicted to pornography. I'm not addicted to TV or chocolate. I just need to watch or eat something to keep my mood happy. Sometimes, just like David, we see the sin but don't kill it and enjoy flirting with it. We think we're in control, that we can manage sin. This is the heart in its desperate desire and wickedness, its desperate desire for self satisfaction, for quick fulfillment. Here's a quote from Une Mokhatle, the lead pastor of Rooted Fellowship. Our hearts should be like consultants and not the CEO. This simply means we should not elevate our hearts and follow our hearts, but can seek direction and assistance from our hearts because that's where our thoughts, emotions, and actions live. We should follow the real CEO, King Jesus. The problem comes when we elevate our hearts to CEO status and not the consultant status. The third danger of following our heart. Following our hearts can confuse us. Much like consultants, our, heart can, our hearts can flip-flop. Our hearts can change on us. Think of a choir. All the voices are in sync, harmonizing and blending well together led by a conductor who conducts them. Our hearts are more like a band that is trying to outdo itself or trying to outdo others. The Incredibles is a superhero movie where Mr. Incredible and Elastic Girl, who are husband and wife, have superpowers along with three of their kids. Buddy Pine is a, is a villain that fights against the Incredibles. Buddy Pine, in a scene, complains and argues with Mr. Incredible about something that Mr. Incredible says. This is what Mr. Incredible says. Be true to yourself. Buddy Pine says, to which part of me should I be true to? Because of the statement, be true to yourself. Think about it. Should I be true to the emotions, to the wise thinking, to the desire for action, then we flip and flop as those who are confused. Proverbs 28, 26 says, whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Proverbs 28, verse 14, blesses a man who always fears the Lord, but he who hardens his heart will fall into trouble. If we follow our hearts, we may be found out to be fools, we may find ourselves in trouble, because the heart is desperately sick and it is wicked. We have so far come to understand our hearts as bigger than just a muscle that pumps blood. Our hearts, our emotions, our thoughts, the center of who we are, they are our experiences and where desire for action comes from. But we've also come to understand that we can't trust our hearts. Therefore, we can't follow our hearts because our hearts are sick and deceitful beyond healing. We need a heart transplant. We need a new heart. We may be born with a sinful nature, but God, because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, can put that sinful nature to death. We receive a new heart when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, when we realize that we desperately need a Savior who brings life, a Savior who brings joy, hope and peace with God, with one another and with ourselves. Just a quick side road. If you're a Christian listening to this message, you're thinking about your new heart. Surely I can follow my new heart because I'm a new creation. I have put my faith and trust in God so I can follow my new heart. Romans has this as an answer to that statement. Romans 7, verse 22 to 23. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So having a new regenerated heart in Christ doesn't mean we can follow the heart. We delight in the law of God. We know God, but our own self opposes and wages war against God. This war in ourselves between the new regenerated heart and our old selves means that we can't fully trust our heart blindly. 
This is why the Bible actually says we should lead and guard our hearts rather than the Bible saying we should follow our hearts. Before we get to how we lead our hearts, let's look at three reasons why we should guard our hearts. That's our third point this morning, why we should guard our hearts. The first one, our heart is important. Our heart is important. They are valuable. Our hearts are the essence of who we are. This is where all our desires, our hopes, and dreams live. The passion lives here. This is how we connect with God. This is how we connect with others. If our heart dies, so do we. This is why it's important to guard our hearts. Proverbs 4 verse 23 says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. The CSB translation says, guard your hearts above all else. Above all else means more than anything else. Means more importantly, means with priority, we need to guard our hearts more than anything else. So the first reason we should guard our hearts is because our hearts are important. The second reason is our hearts are the source of life. From out of the heart flow the spring of life. This is a picture of a waterfall. At the top of the waterfall, we see water flowing down into the dam, and there will then be smaller channels of water that move from the dam. So out of the heart flows everything else. If at the top of the waterfall, the water is stopped, then there's no water that flows into the dam, there's no water that flows into the channels, there's no water that flows anywhere else. If the water at the top is polluted, then all the channels will be polluted. All our thoughts will be trapped. All our emotions will be on a knife's edge or even negative. Our actions will be unloving. They will be hurtful. Our words to others will be hurtful. Maybe our posture and demeanor will be of someone lazy and idle, like the sluggard. The way we relate to family will be broken and without love. Your work will also be impacted because your attitude has changed. Your witness is lukewarm and might as well not be present because it will affect everything else. We need to guard our heart because it's important. For from the heart flows everything else. The third one, third reason why we should guard our hearts. Our hearts are under attack. The fact that we need to guard our heart means there is something that is trying to take or steal or destroy. You don't guard something that is not under threat. Something we are not aware that is at war. The devil is lurking and looking for ways to steal, kill, and destroy. Looking for ways to poison the source of life, the top of the waterfall. The attacks may be similar to hurt by a partner or a loved one that shakes you and causes poor decisions which poison the heart. Could be disappointment from job opportunities or the lack of job opportunities which cause this discontentment or lack of passion or maybe even bring out the sluggard. Could be trauma which could be from loss. Any situation we face in this life has the ability to attack the heart and cause unintended emotions, actions, attitudes and thoughts to fester. Let's also be real. Sometimes we give the devil too much credit. I think sometimes he isn't even attentive. He knows that we're ready to score the own goals ourselves. We need to be alert because our hearts are on the line. Our hearts are important. And from our hearts, everything flows. And that's why we need to guard our hearts. The last point, how to lead our hearts. Proverbs 23 verse 19 says, Hear, my son, and be wise, and direct your heart in the way. We need to be wise and rather show our heart to God. That is the way mentioned here. The Bible says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If left to itself, if left starving of direction, then the heart will find itself feeding from the table of the world and being full of it. Remember the quote from John Piper. If you don't feel strong desires for the manifestation of the glory of God, it is not because you have drunk deeply and are satisfied. It is because you have nibbled so long at the table of the world, 
Your soul is stuffed with small things and there's no room for the great. Three ways in which we can lead our hearts. We need to live with a posture of repentance. We need to live with a posture of repentance. King David, even though he was caught up in sin, he is credited as someone who was after God's own heart. Let's look at Psalm 51, verse 1 to 4. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and, and blameless in your just judgment. David repents before the Lord, acknowledges his sin, cries out for mercy. This is not the only time that David opens his heart and brings it before God. Psalm 139, 23 to 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there's any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. David is vulnerable before God. David trusts God instead of putting his trust in his heart and in himself. He has seen the wickedness of the heart. He can't be trusted, but is rather running after the, God of, the heart of God to sanctify his heart. Second way that we can lead our hearts is we need to train our hearts. We need to train our hearts. If your heart is constantly seeking after the things of this world, it is being trained either subconsciously or consciously by you. If you're looking at ungodly pictures, then you are building up desires for that which you are training yourself in. You are building discontentment and desire. If you're drinking regularly and getting drunk, you're building up coping mechanisms and building desire and dependency. This is the same with many things. So what are you looking at? What are you thinking about? What are you training yourself in? If you don't think you're training your heart, then you're actually training it in the ways of the world. If you think about the war that is happening in us, the war between the regenerated and trans transplanted heart with the old self, then two strategies help us to train our hearts. Active, the first strategy is an active or attacking strategy. We need to be active and, and put in the right efforts to train our hearts. Psalm 119 verse 9 to 11 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Proverbs 3 verse 1 to 3. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. We need to store the word of God in our hearts. We need not forget his teaching and we need to keep his commands. This is following the path of uprightness. Reno said something to this effect last week. On the days when you are having a bad day, do you remember if you read the Bible? And on the days where you're having a good day, didn't you start with the Bible? To fight against the unhealthy desires, we need to not only stop in our pursuit, but we need to replace the desires in our heart with the Word of God. We need to replace the desires in our heart with the Word of God and not only stop the pursuit of things that we shouldn't be doing. Muzi Zim shares this example about a vacuum, meaning emptying something but not leaving it empty, but rather filling it with something that satisfies the empty space. If you leave it empty, you're inviting that which you removed to reoccupy it. A study by the Center of Bible Engagement who helps to understand the active strategy of training our hearts has this research. They sampled a few thousand people and found that reading the Bible three times a week had no effect. Well, well, no, not no effect, but negligible, insignificant effect. Three times a week. So reading the Bible three times a week had no or negligible effect. 
Question is, what are you doing in the other four days a week? What are you reading and training yourself in? If you train yourself in reading the Bible, setting aside time four or more days a week, these are the changes that you might see. Feeling lonely drops 30%. Anger issues drop 32%. Bitterness in relationships drops 40%. Getting drunk drops 57%. Feeling spiritually stagnant drops 60%. How can it not drop by 60%? Because normally those who are feeling spiritually stagnant are not reading the word of God enough. Pornography drops 61%. Sex out of marriage drops 68%. Gambling drops 75%. This is replacing that which you're trying to stop with the word of God as you train your heart. This is the active strategy. Let's look at some of the things that increase. We spoke about some of the things that decrease. Sharing faith, your faith with others increases by 228%. Sharing your faith by others increases by 228%. Discipling others increases by 231%. Memorizing scripture increases by 400%. And 7%. How can you memorize what you don't read? A heart for God will grow if you're knowing God more by reading the Bible. If you're praying to God, listening to Christian music or sermon podcasts, if you're speaking to others and sharing your faith, meeting with God's people in the worship service, this is where we are edified. This is where we are built up. This is like half time in our training. What happens during halftime in group sporting activities is that there's a realignment of strategy. There's an encouragement that is built up. Looking at one another and building a fondness to struggle together. There's a desire to walk and fight with your fellow teammates. Normally when teams leave the halftime break and start the second half, they are ready. That is what happens during our worship services. We see other believers. This is our halftime. We're encouraged by that. So your coming to church is not only for you. It is also for other saints who see and interact with you and are edified. But coming to church is also for you. For we sing songs together and you remember some words that speak to the situation that you're in. We fellowship together and you are edified. We are realigned and sent out into the next week. If you don't come to half time to be edified, then what is being built up and positioned for a witness field week? That's the active strategy in training yourself. Let's look at the defensive strategy in training yourself. It's first stopping the on goals. How are you guarding your heart? Are you allowing things of the world to crowd out God in your heart? Are you accepting things as normal that maybe was not normal five or ten years ago as the world changes and becomes more accepting of sin, of indecency, and moral decay? Are you normalizing this because it's the cultural flow? What are you watching on your phone, tablet, TV, or laptop? What are you searching on the internet? How are you guarding your mind and heart from the continual lax approach to godliness in culture and in the world. This doesn't mean we need to live under a rock or throw away our devices. It means we need to be careful what we are training ourselves in. And if we need to cut something out, then we need to do that with extreme violence. Thomas Watson, in his book, The Doctrine of Repentance, says, Till sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweeter. Sometimes we think sin is sweeter. We act like it is. We consume the things of the world so much that the taste of bitterness is suppressed and it is normalized. We need the gospel to realign Christ as central in our lives. We need the Holy Spirit to continue showing us the things we need to put off, the bitterness. We need the Holy Spirit to show us the ways in which we follow our hearts and are deceived. 
the ways in which we don't live in wisdom. We need the Holy Spirit to help us live in wisdom, to help us turn to God, to help us continue to reform and renew our hearts in God. There are two ways to respond to this message. Ezekiel 36, verse 26 to 27. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. If you're a Christian, then this is true for you. God has given you a new heart. You have the Holy Spirit in you. If you're not a Christian today, then the good news is that God wants to give you a new heart. Not because of anything that you do, not because of who you are, but because of who he is. He is a good, good father. He is a loving God. He wants to know and have a relationship with you. He wants to save you from the clutches of sin and bring you freedom in Jesus who died for you. This is the love that is so undeniable. Jesus' death on the cross for all our sins. And all you have to do is repent and believe. If this is you, I'm going to lead us in prayer. I will ask that you repeat after me quietly in your heart. Let's enter into a time of prayer and a posture of response. Let's bow our heads, church. If you're not a Christian, if you don't know the Lord Jesus, then repeat after me as I lead us in this prayer. Just repeat after me quietly in your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I've lived a life void of truth and life. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. Please help me to seek you all of my days. Help me to know you more as Lord and Savior. Help me to follow you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Let's continue in our posture of prayer with our eyes closed and our heads bowed. If you repeated this prayer, then you are a Christian. And, re and, repeating and, and repenting and believing in Jesus as Lord and Savior. If you are a Christian... You have the Holy Spirit in you. You have a new heart. Christianity is about believing in Jesus as Lord and Savior. It is also about receiving the gift of eternal life and receiving a new heart. A heart that beats for God. Sometimes we lose focus. And our new heart is relying on itself rather than relying on God. Maybe we haven't guarded our hearts like we should. The heart now has some blocked arteries that needs to be unblocked. Maybe there is work that God needs to do to restore our hearts for him. Let's collectively stand, church. If you are in need of your heart restored with our heads bowed and still in that posture of prayer, if you are in need of your heart restored, then repeat after me quietly in your heart. I'm going to ask that you open up your palms, ready to receive as we pray quietly in our hearts. Lord Jesus, I have wandered from the path of truth and light. I have not guarded my heart like I should. Please renew my heart and grant me a steadfast spirit in me, a purpose rooted in you. Please return the joy of my salvation in you. Help me to guard my heart and to lead my heart actively. Help me to train my heart and devote myself to you. In Jesus' name. Let's continue in prayer. Lord Jesus, we we thank you that by the power of your spirit that you continue to sanctify us, 
continue to change and conform us to the likeness of Christ. We thank you that you continue to be at work by the power of your spirit. And we, th- we know that through the work and the power of the spirit that you'd continue to conform us to the likeness of Christ. Help us where we are deceived. Help us where our heart are not beating for you, but beating for other things that don't bring real and ultimate joy. Help us to find joy in you by the power of the Spirit. Help us to look upon the cross of Christ. Help us to turn to you. Help us to live with a posture of repentance. Live with a posture of training our hearts in the right ways. Help us to spend time reading your word. Build in us a desire for your word. Help us to spend time putting in the right things, listening to good music, listening to sermon podcasts. Help us to immerse ourselves in your word, for we know that once we do that, we see lasting change. Would you do a work in us? Would you help us to continually be led by you, to look to you to lead us, and not to look to our hearts to lead us? Would you transform our hearts, transform us for yourself? We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.